When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Allo or Allbirds, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and great marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling, and for shoppers, buying, simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. Nobody does online business better than Shopify. It's home of ShopPay, the number one checkout in the world. You can use it to boost conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going through to checkout. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income to upgrade your selling today. That's shopify.com slash income. The Subaru Share the Love event is a fulfilling way to get in a great vehicle and support a great cause. When you buy or lease a new Subaru from now until January 2nd, Subaru and its retailers will donate a minimum of $300 to charity. By the end of this year's event, Subaru will have donated nearly $320 million to charity. Visit Subaru.com slash share to support a great cause today. Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcasts, and Killer Podcast presents Who Killed? A podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. Live from Denver 7, 10 minutes of nonstop news starts now. Friends of a young woman who was killed 26 years ago are looking for new clues in hopes of solving this cold case. Take a look. These four loyal friends from high school back in Boston gathered at a bus stop in Inglewood last night. And that's where Helene Prasinski was last seen alive. One day later, her body was discovered near Daniels Park Road. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. We want everyone to be talking about this because someone knows something. And if you're listening, if you're watching, and you know something, you can do something to really help this case. Please do so. Those classmates are meeting with the Colorado Bureau of Investigations later today to try to learn if DNA from the suspect somehow could help with this case. We'll keep you posted. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Who Killed? I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcast, and Killer Podcast production. I've spent the past few weeks researching genealogical DNA and how it has impacted the world of cold cases and cold case investigations. I started with a case from 65 years ago, which is either the oldest cold case solved or one of them. Then I was lucky enough to have Nick from the True Crime Garage podcast back on the show to discuss a number of murders solved using DNA. And since DNA is literally part of all our lives, it only makes sense to continue to bring you stories about breakthroughs, since they basically seem to happen every week. So, on this week's show, we are going to continue the momentum by looking at a very sad case of a young woman who landed her dream internship a thousand miles from home and was looking forward to becoming the next great journalist, maybe even the next great Barbara Walters. This week, we are talking about who killed Helene Przinsky. Now, these cases are very tough to research because the victims' families are the ones that have suffered the most because they've been left in the dark for decades. And thanks to Channel 9 News they did an exhaustive piece on Helene's case and they look back at her early years and they state Helene Przinsky spent the first part of her life in South Huntington on Long Island, the youngest of three children of Chester Przinsky, an army veteran and engineer and his wife, Henrietta. Her sister, Janet was nine years older while her brother Chet was 12 years older. And she was an active teenager in high school, where she participated in theater as well as music. She would go on to attend Wheaton College, where she studied journalism. And that's where she would end up seeking that radio station internship in Denver, Colorado. Now, Ms. Przinsky, again, 
landed the internship and had been working as a news department intern at KHOW in Denver for about a month. And she was living with her grandparents in Englewood, Colorado, which was a Denver suburb. Now, I've seen different reports on where she was staying on the night that she went missing, and it's totally possible that she had multiple places that she could have gone. So I'm just going to leave that up to uh, reporting back in the day. And again, this case is from 1980, so it is one of those things that uh, could have just been lost in translation. And as I mentioned before, Helene was the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Chester Przinsky. Now, she lived on Porter Lane, which was in Hamilton, Massachusetts, and she was a graduate of Hamilton Regional High School. And again, while Helene's death may have seemed random at one point, there was a time where Colorado investigators believed there was a link between her slain and two previous murders in the Denver metropolitan area. As we have said so many times in this show, Helene's hometown of Hamilton, Massachusetts, were shocked over the news of the fatal stabbing. Of course they would be, because stabbings and murders are very uncommon. And unfortunately, Colorado's Douglas County Coroner John Andrews had said that the young woman died of multiple stab wounds. He said there was evidence that she had been raped. Her body was discovered Thursday morning on ranch land in Englewood, which again is a community about 30 miles from Denver. And again, this was uh, about the area where she was staying. So the article goes on to state that Przinsky had been given her first big assignment on that Monday when she covered the killing of a Secret Service agent. And KHOW News Director Mike Anthony had praised her for her work. Now, police said that she left the radio station at 5.30 p.m. in downtown Denver. Her normal routine was to board a bus for the 46-block ride to Englewood, then walk to her home, to the home of her grandparents, with whom she was staying. According to the Boston Globe, her parents, Mr. and Mr. Chester Przinsky, were on their way to Colorado as soon as they heard the news. There was a funeral mass held in the St. Paul's Church in Hamilton. And besides her parents, she left behind her brother Chester, who at that point lived in Shrewsbury, New Jersey, and Janet Johnson of Groton, Connecticut. Isa Zimmerman, who was the principal of the Hamilton Wenham Regional High School, commented to the paper, Helene was a really beautiful person. The whole high school is in a state of shock. She was such a wonderful person, natural, warm, and happy. We just cannot believe such a thing had happened. Hamilton Police Chief Robert Poole, a neighbor of the Przinsky family, said she was just about the happiest child and the sweetest little girl ever. He said the family had lived in the town for about eight years and that her father was an engineer with a Beverly firm. Now, investigators caught a break When the news hit the wires, according to Channel 9, a woman came forward with a remarkable story. She had been driving along Daniels Park Road around 10.20 the night Helene disappeared and had seen a man in the area where her body would be discovered. She was actually able to give a detailed description. A man, 20 to 30 years old, possibly Caucasian, with medium-length brown hair that went over his ears, and he was possibly wearing a mustache. Under hypnosis, the woman recalled even more details. In 1994, according to my regional newspaper, the Akron Beacon Journal, there was fresh hope when a murderer suspected of killing two young women in Colorado's suburbs was arrested. Robert Holes, who was a Beacon Journal staff writer, wrote an article about the rape of a local woman in the 1970s in the Akron area. Janelle Shepard, he wrote, Janelle Shepard broke down and cried when she heard the news. Someone else was dead, and Kenyon B. Tollerton again was a suspect. 
aren't we so lucky to have this guy as a citizen of our fine state? Colorado authorities believe he is responsible for the death of a 14-year-old girl who was raped and stabbed 13 times. Tollerton, an Alliance native, was convicted in the slain of a Colorado woman 13 years ago, five years after he abducted Shepard from the parking lot at Chapel Hill Mall. Quote, police say I might be his only living victim, said Shepard. Tollerton, who was a graduate, 1974 graduate of Marlinton High School, is suspected of being a serial killer who stalked Denver's suburbs. He was arrested in Akron on April 14, 1976, while kidnapping Shepard at gunpoint. The memories of that day still haunt the Summit County woman. Quote, I see his face everywhere, Shepard said. I walk in the mall by myself and I see someone and I say, oh my God, there he is. Tollerton is being held, or at this time was being held, without bond in the Arapahoe County Jail near Denver. He was charged with first-degree murder in the slain of 14-year-old Sissy Pamela Foster, whose partially clad body was found September 1st in a remote area east of Denver. Arapahoe County Sheriff's detectives arrested Tollerton May 11th after a DNA comparison matched semen taken from Foster's body with a blood sample taken from Tollerton when he was in prison for a 1980 rape murder. Detectives in Englewood, Colorado also said Tollerton is the prime suspect in the January 16th, 1980 disappearance and murder of 21-year-old Helene Pruszynski, whose body was found in a field near where she was staying with her grandparents. Now, in the Shepherd case, she stated that the guy walked up to my car and said, I had a flat tire. And I looked down and the tire wasn't flat. But when I looked up, He had a gun pointing at my head. Tollerton forced his way into the car and screamed, Step on it. He kept the gun pointed at her head as she stepped on the gas. Now, the driver's door was still open. Gerald Husky, who was an Akron machinist who had been shopping at the mall with his family, saw the three fifty seven caliber Magnum revolver Tollerton held in his hand. Husky pulled out a toy cork pistol he had taken from one of his sons earlier in the evening and ran toward the shepherd's car. Husky jumped on the Volkswagen's running board, yelling at Shepard to stop. He pointed the toy gun at Tollerton, screaming, Police! Get out of the car! Shepard stopped the Volkswagen and actually got out. Husky dragged Tollerton from the car. This This is a great story because this is somebody going above and beyond being a citizen. Again, Tollerton eventually was arrested at the scene and he pleaded guilty to kidnapping and felonious assault and was eventually sentenced to 2 to 15 years in the Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield. Well, two months later, Tollerton was released from prison after being granted shock probation. Tollerton returned to Alliance, where he found work and was supervised by the Summit County Probation Department. Tollerton was allowed to move to Colorado in March 1979, when his probation was to be supervised by mail and telephone, according to Probation Department memos. Five years passed before Shepard saw Tollerton again. This time it was in a courtroom in Colorado. Tollerton was on trial for killing Donna U. Waugh, a 22-year-old bartender from Denver's, the Denver suburb of Englewood. Now, Tollerton was arrested July 28, 1981, after an Arapahoe County Sheriff's deputy on routine patrol saw Tollerton walking in a field with a flashlight about 1.30 a.m. When the deputy asked him what he was doing, he said, oh, I just like to walk around. I just like to walk around the area." Uh, he left the deputy who questioned him and uh, noted that the license plate on Tollerton's car 
The deputy then searched the field and made it a grisly discovery, and that was Waugh's dis- decomposed body. She had been dead for about a week. A short time later, when police stopped Tollerton's car in nearby Aurora, Colorado, he admitted seeing the body in the field. When he was asked why he didn't mention it to the deputy who had interviewed him in the field, Tollerton said, quote, I think I need a lawyer. Now that is according to Doc documents from the court. Investigators found that Tollerton had stalked Waugh, dubbing her the, quote, shower girl in conversations with friends, according to another court affidavit. Tollerton, the affidavit alleged, had watched Waugh shower in her apartment, which was near his own apartment. On February 10th, 1991, after he served 10 years in prison on murder and federal gun convictions, he was released from prison and put on probation for six months. Shepard said she heard that Tollerton had been back in Northeast Ohio since then to visit his family in Alliance. Quote, it makes me angry that they released this guy, she said. Once he was off parole, he was free to go anywhere. And as prime as a suspect as this guy must have been, it turns out it wasn't him. So like all the previous attempts to find the killer, this one failed as well. Unfortunately for the family, the case went cold and it stayed cold until 1999 when authorities announced they would attempt to use the latest DNA technology and revisit the unsolved murder of Helene Pruszynski. Investigators from the Douglas County Sheriff's Department Inglewood Police Department and the Colorado Bureau of Investigation had joined together to reopen the case. And mind you, again, this is 1999, quote unquote, using cutting edge DNA technology. As you all know, with the theme of these past few weeks, technology in the world of DNA has drastically improved since 1999 and even in the past five years. But in the press release, they said, quote, with the advancements in technology, we're going to try some things we couldn't do 19 years ago, Englewood detective Clay Forrington said. Now, again, her body was found after a short but intensive search. It was a brutal discovery because her hands were bound bound behind her back, and she had been raped and stabbed 19 times. Hair and semen evidence had been collected from the scene, but it was apparently it was so sparse that DNA tests were inconclusive. However, updates in testing coupled with the use of new database DNA databases may find a match among thousands of convicted rapists. And that was according to Douglas Sheriff's Sergeant Attila Dennis. Quote, they are sort of doing detective work in reverse, taking people who were already convicted and then trying to connect them to the evidence, according to Dennis. Investigators said they are trying to connect Pruszynski's killing to three high-profile murders around the same time. They are checking for a connection to Kenyon Tollerton, Tollerton, a computer programmer who was convicted of murdering Donna Wo, Waugh of Englewood in 1980. And again, authorities used DNA evidence to link Tollerton, whom police described as a, quote, serial killer of petite white females. That is a description that you want to have on your gravestone. And he was convicted of the killing of, again, Sissy Foster, who was 14. She was found in a field near Byers in 19... 19- 93. He was sentenced to life without parole plus 48 years after pleading guilty to the murder. Now, Dennis did decline to identify the other murder cases the task force is reviewing. Quote, there wasn't much detectives could do with DNA evidence they collected at the time. You got to hand it to them, though. How could they have fathomed the use of this evidence in the future? And again, investigators preserved male DNA recovered from the scene. But no analysis was done immediately, according to the arrest affidavit. 
In 1999, a DNA profile was developed and uploaded to a criminal database, but no potential suspects were identified then or over the years as more people were added to it. But that didn't stop the pursuit of the killer. In fact, the case was re-examined again in 2000, 2005, 2010, and 2013. And again, this is a good example of really dogged police work. I mean, this is a police force that clearly wanted this case solved. But despite their best efforts, the follow-up investigation didn't go anywhere. Now, the investigation did discover eight women who may have been related to the killer, but despite the best attempts at locating anybody else connected to these women, they weren't able to do so. So fast forward to 2019, and things really took off. Investigators used DNA recovered at the crime scene and focused first on finding relatives, which included a woman in Georgia. Now, this is where the search eventually led them to Clanton, who changed his name in Florida two years after Helene Prozinski's murder. And according to court documents, he was originally known as Curtis Allen White. I mention this almost every time, but it is amazing how many of these killers have just killer type of names. Curtis Allen White. I mean, just like he was born to be a bastard. Anyway, Clant was arrested on December 11th, 2019, after Douglas County Sheriff's investigators quote-unquote surreptitiously collected a beer mug from a bar that he had visited and had it tested for DNA. White had been sentenced to 30 years behind bars in Arkansas after pleading guilty to first-degree rape in 1975. In that case, authorities said he enters, entered a woman's home on the pretext of using her phone and then forced her into a bedroom at knife point and then assaulted her. But the good old justice system let him serve only four years and he was out on parole. And after the murder, Clanton was married at least twice. And like a lot of crazy people, he decided to head to Florida for a fresh start. His first marriage was to an old girlfriend from Arkansas, whom he wed in 1980. Their loving, loving marriage lasted a whopping 30 days. By 1982, he had bounced to Florida again, where he changed his name and this is where he got married and divorced a second time and was arrested on a domestic violence charge in 1998. Now, I'm going to read directly from the Channel 9's story about Helene's murder. Quote, Almost immediately, they knew the woman had been brutalized, sexually assaulted, and stabbed to death. Her hands were bound behind her back with nylon straps. Her identity was settled nearly as quickly, and Arapahoe County's sheriff deputy, who worked part-time at KHOW, arrived at the scene. He knew he was staring at the body of Helene Prasinski. Detectives worked the scene carefully, looking for evidence. In the dirt along the edge of the two-lane road, they noticed tracks left by a vehicle and footprints, two sets of them in the snow leading out into the field. One set was apparently from cowboy boots. Those are the only footprints that were turned. They gathered everything they could that might help them figure out who did such a terrible thing. And they basically found a empty milk carton, a piece of bread, an old can. They took pictures and made plaster casts of the tire tracks as well as the footprints, which again is pretty typical in 1980. Now, I mentioned earlier in this episode about the composite sketch. Now, the artist drew a quote-unquote remarkably realistic composite of the possible suspect. This is where things get sad after 40 years of a case being unsolved. 
Almost every single one of her immediate family members had died in decades since her murder. So Miss uh, Pruszynski's older sister I mentioned was Janet Johnson. And she actually received a phone call and a prosecutor said homicide investigators had made a breakthrough thanks to advances in genetic genealogy and dogged police work. Investigators say they were able to put together an extensive family tree of potential suspects using semen that was recovered from the body of Helene and working with forensic genealogists at quote, the United Data Connect and websites like Ancestry.com and JedMatch.com. The DNA, again, had been preserved at the time of the murder, but, of course, that technology did not exist. They did run it through the database in 1999, you know, via the FBI, but, again, nothing was successful. They did try to get DNA off that milk carton that I mentioned they picked up at the crime scene, but... That was not successful, and the next time, they wouldn't be so unlucky. The investigators actually followed Mr. Clanton to a local bar where they said they were able to get his DNA from a beer mug that he was drinking from. And ding, 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 we have a winner. Clanton, a.k.a. Curtis Allen White, DNA matched the DNA profile of Miss Przinsky's killer. So Mr. Clanton was charged with first-degree murder and second-degree kidnapping. And this was all according to the affidavit. And they couldn't charge him with sexual assault because the statute of limitations had expired, unfortunately. Of course, that would have been very nice, but it is what it is. Better to get him on murder charges anyway. But one of the interesting things in these cases is it's it's fun to like kind of compare the composite sketches with the suspects after they've been arrested. Sometimes they're really (laughs) nothing like what they were drawn as, and sometimes they're amazingly similar. I mean, I look at the Molly Bish case as a good example recently when they came up with a suspected killer of Molly Bish. And in this case, the sketch was like I said before, remarkably similar to that of Curtis Allen White. Now, White actually worked as a landscaper when he was in Colorado. So, uh, landscaping is one of those professions similar to roofing where you let strangers in your yard and they can pick up on all of your routines. I know the same can be said about a number of outdoor professions, but these two in particular allow strangers an up-close look at your home and really anybody who lives in your neighborhood. And I'm not trying to say that everyone in those industries are bad. I'm just saying that they don't do as many background checks and they can basically hire people off the street for some of the work. Now, the Douglas County Sheriff... Tony G. Spurlock said at the news conference announcing the arrest that more than 22 detectives spent the last year pursuing the case, which was a joint investigation with state, local, and federal law enforcement partners, as well as the group Metro Denver Crime Stoppers. Now, again, at the time of the killing, Clanton was on parole from that Arkansas... (laughs) I mean, what the hell is this guy doing free? I mean, okay, so he's on parole for the Arkansas rape. And he had been released to live in the suburban Denver Denver home of a former counselor who offered to help him. I mean, I know you don't want to always look back and go, things could have been better, but hello, people. He raped the woman, didn't do that much time. I don't think there was much remorse. It's a little dangerous and a little stupid, in my opinion, to let somebody out and then let them travel to another state where they basically are anonymous. And that's just really unacceptable, in my opinion. Now, again, this is just my opinion, but... 
Curtis Allen White was a predator, and the fact that they let him out of jail just after only four years of a 15 year sentence, it's just, or 30 years. I mean, it just, it's nuts. I mean, it's nuts. And I know Arkansas has had their fair share of interesting cases. Uh, just look at the west of Memphis case, um, Mina Airport. Uh, I suggest you guys listen to Boys on the Tracks episode from the guys at the True Crime Garage podcast because that is one of the best four-part series on the state of Arkansas and how corrupt it was back in the 1980s and 1990s. And you will just be amazed. So Clanton is arrested and charged with murder or accused of murder. And he denies any responsibility. As he's being extradited to Colorado, on the drive to the airport, he decided to talk. And I'm going to read this to you because it's an interesting perspective and it's just kind of disturbing in a lot of ways. And so again, this is the confession to Helene's murder while riding to the airport. Quote, okay, Barilla said, so when we contacted you the other day, when we were interviewing you about uh, your time in Colorado, did you have an idea what we were talking to you about? Yes, Clanton replied. Okay. And what did you think that was about? About murder, Clanton said. Okay. Why did you think we were talking about murder? Did anybody, did, did either of the cops mention the word murder to you? No, Clanton said faintly. No, Barella replied. Okay, so why did you think this was about murder? Because I knew it was going to come up and get me one day, Clanton said. Why was it going to come up and get you? Did you murder someone? Because I did it, Clanton said. Okay, you did what? Barella asked. I killed the girl they're accusing me of killing, Clanton coldly replied. Clanton would go on to plead guilty to first-degree murder in February of that year. Now, in a bu- brutal interview with detectives, he admitted to the killing, telling them he abducted Pruszynski at knife point, intending to rape her, then bound her hands behind her back, and drove her to the field where her body was found. Quote, Mr. Clanton describes her as staying as friendly as she could, asking him not to hurt her. And this was according to Senior Deputy District Attorney Chris Wilcox. And this is all in the court papers. Now, Clanton had instructed Pruszynski to get on her knees, telling her she could walk home even as he prepared to kill her. How he approached her after she got off the bus. He said, I told her I had a knife, Clanton said. Quote, she says, I see it. And I said, well, let's go. And she said, okay, I'll go. She wasn't going to flight. I just opened the passenger door, told her to get in, and I went around and got in the car and took whatever I was going to use to tie her hands with, and we went somewhere. And that's basically when he raped her. And she asked me what I was doing, and I told her I was kidnapping her for money. And she said, well, my parents don't have any money and stuff like that. I didn't tell her what I was really doing until we got into the woodshed. And he says that we got out of the vehicle and walked through the field, crossed the fence and walked. Oh, geez. Told her to get down on her knees and said, I'm going to have to walk home from here. So don't get up until after I leave. And. Again, he's not really going to let her leave. And, you know, he just kind of says, he went on to say that, and as has happened with me on several occasions for some reason or another, I just kind of step out of myself and watch myself do that. And this is according to the newspaper and Channel 9 News. By that, he meant plunging a knife into Helene's back. 
nine times. Now again, the work necessary to bring the January 16th, 1980 murder of Helene Przinsky to a close took a lot of work. And it was the work of 100 individuals from more than two dozen agencies. And Spurlock said investigators were looking into whether Clanton or Curtis Allen White could have been responsible for other sexual assaults reported in the Inglewood area around the time she was killed. Douglas County Judge Teresa Slade sentenced James Curtis Slanton, 63, during an emotional nearly three-hour hearing in which more than a dozen people testified about the lasting impact of the killing over the past four decades. Quote, It never got any easier, Janet Johnson, Przinsky's sister, told the judge through tears, describing her sister as a warm, kind, bright, and friendly. Brzezinski's murder on January 16th, 1980, devastated the family forever, Johnson said. It was as if someone reached out and reached in and tore our hearts out. As she was describing how she'd cry herself to sleep at night, wondering how her parents, who have since died, were coping with their grief. Brzezinski moved to Colorado weeks before she was killed in order to pursue that internship we talked about at K-H-O-W, and again, she'd ride the bus to and from work, and all she did was walk a few blocks each evening, and this is where Clanton made his move. And this case is another tragic example of technology not being where it needed to be to stop a killer, because hopefully we find out if Clanton was involved with any other sexual offenses or murders. I mean, let's just hope that he wasn't. But, you know, most people who do these types of things, unfortunately, they're not one and dones. And again, it's really not hard to imagine this guy committing crimes across the Southwest in Florida. I mean, if he's willing to kill a girl he pulled off the street, then who knows what else he could have done. But... Luckily, we have law enforcement that is willing to spend the extra money and really go that extra step to bring a type of closure for the families and the communities that they represent. Again, the cases that I've covered have all had a similar theme, and that is a group of lawmen and women coming together and closing some of the country's coldest cases. So thank you guys so much for listening this week. It's always a pleasure. As all of you know by now, I drop new episodes of Who Killed every Friday, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, you can help support the show by clicking on the link in the show notes. You can find me on PayPal, or you can contribute to the show simply by using the Venmo app on your smartphone. Show donations can be sent to at bill-huffman-3. Now, again, any contribution really does help keep these slow burn podcasts running. You can also leave a five star review wherever you listen to your shows because that helps keep the shows that I do and the cases I cover in the spotlight. And again, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as always, be healthy and stay safe. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. How far would you go in your pursuit of the American dream? Would you put in the work? 911, what's your emergency? Would you take a big risk? What's the problem? What's the problem? Would you cheat? Would you lie? Would I shop? Would I shop? Would you kill? My mom is dead. My mom is right there. 
I'm Jeremy Schwartz, and I'll be taking you inside the minds of some of our most notorious felons and outlaws, exploring the dark side to the American dream. You'll meet the picture-perfect brothers who teamed up to kill their parents, the thief who stole babies and ruined countless lives, the crypto king who siphoned off billions in the name of saving the world, and plenty more. From assassins to gangsters to killers and con artists, whatever the case, whoever the criminal, you don't know the full story until now. Go to AmericanCriminal.com or search for and follow American Criminal wherever you get your podcasts.